afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Frankly Speaking Baseball right here on WWBG 1470 AM and Tobacco Road Sports Radio.com. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, am I fired up. I am so fired up today. Um, we have what less than 24 hours away, 24 hours away, Demon Deacon fans, for our players to take the field in Omaha and go after the College World Series Championship. First of all, we want to thank many, many people for watching this show today. We want to thank several Facebook groups, including Real Baseball Talk, Baseball Talk, Baseball Life, Baseball Away Life, and traditional baseball fans, all for tuning in on our social media networks. We are also national. And boy, oh boy, you got to be fired up for this Wake Forest Demon Deacons team. They're incredible. Every aspect of the game, folks, every single aspect of the game, this team plays well. It's just incredible. Tom Walker has this team playing great baseball fundamentally, great pitching, great hitting, great defense, great speed, just great fundamental baseball. And it is a great honor. It is a great thrill and, of course, a pleasure to have with us a very, very busy man. We know that. He's the play-by-play -play voice of the Demon Deacons. Let's welcome in Stan Cotton. Stan, how you doing? I'm great, Larry. How are you? I need to bottle some of your enthusiasm and energy uh, for, for out here in Omaha. Yeah, I'll tell you what, you know, think of this. Listen to me here. 1955. 1955. Talk about the jubilation, the excitement about this team. The Winston-Salem area has to be fired up. For this team making it to Omaha. Yeah, no question. That's a great point. I mean, it's been 68 years since Wake Forest made the College World Series. And the last time they did it, they won the whole thing. Back in 1955, they played for the national title in 1949 as well. Came in second. But uh, 55 is the last time. You know, Wake's had a lot of good teams, obviously, over the years. ACC champions. And and teams that have made it to the Super Regionals, but just haven't been able to get past that final hurdle, that Super Regional, that, that last game. Wake was one out away in 2017 at the Gainesville Regional against the Florida Gators, one out away of going back to the College World Series, but couldn't get it done. Florida went on to win the national championship. So that's all behind Wake now, the, the long way of almost 70 years, all those near, all that's over, right? And, and now is, I think, uh, probably the, the best team in, in Wake Forest history, even though 55 won it. Uh, you talk to some people who were around in 55, like Dr. Gene Hooks, who was on Wake's baseball team in 49 that played for, for the title. And he was talking about that era. And he says, no question, this, this is, a, a better team so you know this is wake's best baseball team let's kind of just all agree on that that doesn't mean they're going to win a title uh, in the next few days but uh you know wake is one of eight that's going to have a chance to, to win it all this year and, and, and you mentioned uh just moments ago this, this team has it all from elite starting pitching incredible depth in the bullpen a team that hits with power, hits for average, all the in, in a much improved defensively team that I don't think gets enough uh, talk. But this is a much better defensive baseball team than Wake has had in, in a number of years. So you put all that in the hopper, and what shakes out is just a well-rounded, confident baseball team that's number one in the country that has 52 wins that's going to enter play here in the College World Series with an eye on that trophy. Again, doesn't mean that, that you know nobody's going to hand it to them, right? I mean, this is eight great teams. Yep. Uh, but but I think Wake's got as good a chance as any uh, to leave Omaha with a national championship. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Before we get to talking about on the field, I want to talk to you a minute because, you know, Stan, you've been there a long time at Wake Forest. And, you know, when you hear about states with great college baseball, I think one of the first states that always seems to come up is the state of Florida because you have Miami, you have FSU, you have, you mentioned the Gators down there, just to name a few. 
But talk about what this does for the state of North Carolina and mainly Wake Forest off the field with recruiting and getting young players now attracted to the North Carolina area. And it's not just Wake Forest. I mean, what Duke made it, you know, into the NCAA tournament. A couple of years ago was NC State. I mean, people are starting to look now at Wake Forest and the North Carolina area to start playing baseball. And that's huge for the city of North Carolina, excuse me, the state of North Carolina. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Wake and and Duke, you mentioned state. Of course, North Carolina has a great uh, baseball program. East Carolina plays really, really, it's just team after team after team. You're, You're exactly right. And uh, you know, Tom Walter and his staff have obviously done a great job over the last several years of recruiting elite baseball players to Winston-Salem. And now, you know, they, they've made it that next step, right, to, to, to Omaha. They've done so much with regard to uh, facility enhancement, uh, pitching lab, all these things uh, that I, I just can't imagine that that exposure like this now just can't help Tom and, and his staff even get uh, more elite with regard uh, to recruiting. I know they feel very good uh, about what they've done coming up for the next year or two, and and this just has to be a you know a, a big time uh, feather in the cap uh, for, for Wake Forest. And and, and right, it, it brings attention to Wake Forest. It brings attention to the state of North Carolina. It brings attention to the Atlantic Coast Conference and. Uh, it just it's just one of those years where all the moving parts have 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 come together uh, in, in so many positive ways uh, for Wake Forest, and there no question there's residual positivity if you want to put it that way uh, for the rest of the state as well. Yeah, and you know as we go on the field, I mean this offense we're talking to Stan Cotton, voice of the Demon Deacons. This offense has been nothing less then dominant, amazing. I mean, there's so many different words we can come up with. Um, In five NCAA tournament games, they're averaging 15 runs. They hit 19 homers. And, I mean, the team has just showed amazing power. They're batting 359. Talk about this solid one through nine and the amazing power that this team has. Yeah, and it was on full display uh, against Alabama in that second game where Wake hit nine home runs uh, to tie an NCAA tournament record. Brock Wilkin had three and became the the ACC's all-time home run leader with 70 career uh, home runs. 30 of those have come this season. Uh, But it's not just Brock Wilkin. It's, It's, you know, Tommy Hawk led off the first game with Alabama. Uh, with a home run, and he's a diminutive center fielder that you think, uh, when you think about Tommy Hawk, you think about you know, his ability to run, his ability to cover a lot of ground in center field, but he can hit home runs, and that's the deal with every single player, one through nine. I mean, Merrick Houston, who is Wake Forest's freshman shortstop, and he's in the lineup, make no mistake, for his glove, and he saves Wake's, Wake a lot of runs with his defense, and that's his calling card. Well, he had a grand slam in the NCAA tournament. <laughs> so, you know, it's just uh, the, the the game with Bama, the second game, first game for that matter, you know, Wake hit multiple home runs in that game too. It just, you you, you just leave every game wondering, what, what am I going to see next from this team? What can it not do uh, with the bat? And, you know, there's been a lot of talk around the country. Well, Wake – Wake Forest plays in a small ballpark. This, that, and the other. Well, it's 400 feet to straightaway center field. And if you look at the, the the analytics and the measurements of these home runs, it's not like they're all going down the right field line and they're 301 feet. I mean, these are uh, you know home runs that are at 400, 400 plus, and, and, and would go out in any ballpark. So I I don't think Wake really gets enough credit for the amount of. Uh, power uh, that it has now uh, at the at the World Series here now you know it's it's a deeper ballpark it doesn't carry nearly as well as it does so there probably won't be as many home runs it doesn't mean Wake won't be stripe them in striping them into the gaps and all those type things I, I expect that to be the case I expect Wake to hit some home runs so 
um, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens the next several days. But it's a Wake Forest team that year after year after year has been known for its power. And this uh, this is, uh, I think, the best power hitting team that, that I've seen awake in the last several years. And, you know, Stan, you talk about power as we switch gears. It may be one of the best pitching staffs we've seen in years, too. And it's led, of course, by Rhett Router, who's 15 and 0. But it doesn't stop at Rhett. I mean, they got two or three other great starters on this team. Then you get to the bullpen, which I'm sure some of those starters are going to be mixed in during this series in the bullpen. This team doesn't stop with offense. It has good pitch, and I think it's for the season 2.84 ERA in the tournament. So far, I think in five games, they got like 70 strikeouts. So, like I said, it doesn't stop at power. Oh, not at all. I mean, as I said, I think a few minutes ago, it's an elite pitching staff. Not good. Elite. Mm. And the numbers back it up. You just up and down uh, the, the, the staff. Um, obviously, Rhett Louder gets a lot of the attention, justifiably so. He's 15 and 0. Uh, and, and that's a single season record for Wake Forest. No one has ever won 15 games. Uh, and oh, by the way, he's an, he's a he's a genius. Nearly, you know, he's he's a smart kid, and he's got the best hair in the country. So, uh, <laughs> you know, he's got a lot going for him. But uh, you know, Josh Hartle, Seth Keener, um, Sean Sullivan. On to, it's just crazy. On and on and on into the middle relievers and in the short relievers. Uh, um, uh, it's just it's unbelievable. That, that Wake has this amount of pitchers that, that they can rely on and feel good about at any situation, leading by 10, leading by one, first inning, fifth inning, ninth inning, extra innings, just, hey, let's go to the bullpen, get this guy, and, you know, we've got confidence in him. So I, it's just, I, again, it, it, it has led to all of this, to, to Wake, being the number one team uh, in the country for the last several weeks, to being the number one seed uh, at the College World Series. It, it's been earned. Uh, it's been a great ride. And now this team's got a shot, one of eight, to, to get it done and, and win a national championship. And it's going to take all of that. It's going to take you know, the entire staff. It's going to take Wake to continue to hit the baseball. I mean, it doesn't just happen, uh, right, because all of these teams – are super, super good and playing well because they're here. Right. Uh, all of these teams um, ha have done the necessary things to, to, to make it here, and that's a lot. It takes a lot uh, to get here. Now you got to go to that next level, that next step, and, and keep it going. That's what I'm anxious to see Wake try and do. Uh, we're talking to Stan Cotton, voice of the Demon Deacons. You know, Stan, let's switch it over to uh, Stanford a minute. You know, when I look at the Stanford team – Pitching doesn't scare me. I know they got Quinn Matthews, who everybody saw on Sunday night go off. That incredible, amazing 156 pitch, uh, 16 strikeout game. But after that, their pitching staff is not very solid. I think they gave up more than five runs on average over the year. But I, one thing about Stanford that I do notice is they have six players who are in double digits in home runs led by Tommy Troy and Albert Rios. Um this is a team, I think they got Montgomery, too, who's at 17 homers, that can hit the long ball, can't they? Absolutely. Uh, and it's it's a team that, again, uh, found a way to get out of its regional, had some crazy moments. Um, uh, the finish uh, in in the game that they won over Texas uh, to, to get to the College World Series, mm -hmm. you know, the, the pop-up yep. uh, that the Longhorns couldn't find, I mean, saw – you know, and, and it takes uh, some, I think, uh, at, at times it's going to take some luck over the next few days for somebody uh, to, to get it done. I mean, you have to play good baseball, but you have to have a few breaks, too. Uh, but really good teams make their own breaks. And, and you know, I think you, you got to look at, at Stanford as, as a team that, you know, uh, has done that um, and just plays till the very end and, uh, you know, hits with, with power like Wake does, as you mentioned. And, you know, so you just got to get out there between the white lines and, you know, Wake staff's got to try and uh, go after this Cardinal team and, 
uh, you know, get them back in the dugout, score some runs, and see if that's good enough to move on to the next day in the winner's bracket. So just anxious to get it started. You know, this is, you know, baseball is a long haul. And, you know, the, the conference tournaments, and then you get into the regionals and the super regionals and all the dramatics. And, and, and just to get to this point, now you have to kind of take a deep breath. You know, the Deeks have made, you know, the long trip uh, to Omaha. Uh, Wake's got a big time target on its back as the number one seed. I don't know what all the, the numbers are for one seeds not getting it done, but, you know, it's, it's tough as the number yep. one team to, to, to go all the way through and get it done. So uh, there are a lot of those types of things that don't necessarily stack up in Wake's favor. But you know what? That's all history. That's all stats. Yep. And now Wake's got a chance to, to go do what it does, be Wake Forest, and see if that's good enough. And I really think that it is. And you know what? I was just going to mention that, Stan. You know, there is no doubt in, I think, either of our eyes and a lot of people's eyes, if Wake just does the things they've been doing all year long, play great, fundamental, sound baseball, you know, do all the intangibles, I, I don't think there's any question that they have an unbelievable shot at winning the World Series. But that raises me to my last two questions. First of all, question number one we'll start with um, is – a team that is ranked nationally number one has been at the end of the year. They were the number one seed in the tournament. Now they're the number one seed in the College World Series. How do their head coach keep this team even keel because of all the excitement and the hoopla that goes around the College World Series? Yeah, I think, and, and it, Larry, it's probably cliche to say, well, a team takes on the personality of its coach. It, you could say that, you know, about about every team. But I promise you this, that is exactly the type of baseball team that not only this is, but has been, especially for the last uh, year. This has been a team that uh, has been highly regarded from day one, uh, you know, was – you know, moved through the season, just kept winning and winning and winning. The national ranking started to rise. Uh, you know, when LSU started having some troubles, latter part of the regular season, Wake Forest moved into that number one role and just absolutely embraced it and was not uh, knocked off its center with that number one uh, ranking but beside its name. And I think you, you have to tip your cap to Tom Walter, Wake's head coach, uh, for that, because Tom is a very confident person, but not a cocky person. He respects the game. He respects his opponent. And I think that's why Wake has been able to play well from day one to now, because it respects not only the type of program that it has and is thankful for all the things that it has, but it also says, you know what? We look across into the other dugout. That's a good team, too. That's a team that, that expects to win. That's a team with good pitching and good hitting. That's a team with great coaches. We better respect that dugout, respect this game that we love, and just go do what we can do as confidently and as well as we can do it. And if that's good enough, that's great. If it's not, we will shake their hands. We'll move on to the next day. And that's, that's the way that this team has approached all season long. And I think that's why it's where it is right now. Talking to Stan Cotton, voice of the Demon Deacons. Last question. I know you have to run, uh, Stan, but I want to definitely ask this uh, for the fans' sake as well. Out of all the teams in it, there's eight teams, like you said. Obviously, we're one of them. Which team besides the Demon Deacons are you excited about watching or scares you the most in this tournament? Wow, that, that is a, uh, a great question. Uh, you know, I've heard so much about LSU mm -hmm. uh, over the season. Uh, it, you know, again, it's a team that I think it's last. There was a stretch. I'm not sure if it was exactly the last 14, but there was a 14-game stretch in there toward the end where LSU kind of lost its swagger a little bit. I think won seven, lost seven. You know, most teams will take 500, but LSU spent an awful – long part of the regular season as the number one team in the country and people started to doubt LSU. Well, the Tigers have kind of rebounded, right? And, and have come back in. They've got guys that 
like most of these teams, but they've got a lot of players that are going to be playing pro baseball one day. So I'm anxious um, to, to see LSU. Now, I'm a, I'm a Knoxville native and a Tennessee graduate, and Tennessee's on, you know, Wake's side of the bracket. Yep. There's a chance, uh, you know, depending on how things fall, that, that, that Wake might see Tennessee. And I think Tennessee is kind of a, a team that is – could be sneaky, sneaky good. The number one seed last year, uh, or the number one team in the country last year, that everybody thought, well, Tennessee's just going to waltz to the national title, didn't get out of you know Knoxville, didn't make it to the college that's world right. series. So I think Tennessee's a, a team that's got a chip on its shoulder, and I, you know, not because I'm a Tennessee grab, but I just think Tennessee might be a a, a sleeper. And both those teams are in Wake's side of the bracket, right? So I mean, it's Wake. And Stanford, Tennessee, and LSU. Heck with the other side of the bracket. We'll we'll <laughs> worry about we'll, that later, right? <laughs> we'll worry about that uh, in a few days. But uh, LSU, Tennessee, wow! I, I think uh, of everybody though, LSU is the one that uh, you know I, I'd like to see and and see how really good it is because I think it's a really really good team. Yep, I agree, my friend. Well, listen, sir, you know. We want to thank you very, very much for taking time out of I know what is a busy schedule for you to come on Frankly Speaking Baseball and do us all a favor. Bring the trophy home. Larry, we hope so. It'd be a great day in Wake history for sure. And we're we're glad to be a small part of it uh, on our broadcast. But uh, thanks so much for the invite and we'll uh, you know won't take long. We'll see you in a few days how it all shakes out. All right, my friend. Thanks again. You bet. All right, that was the great Voice of the Demon Deacons, Stan Cotton. Yes, we went a little bit long this segment, but you know what? We're talking College World Series and the Demon Deacons. We'll be back right after this. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Larry Frank from Frankly Speaking Sports coming to you live from Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Are you a professional tattoo artist? If you are, I have good news for you. 13 Daggers Tattoo located at the Fort Campbell Army Post in Clarksville, Tennessee is now looking for professional tattoo artists. If you're a professional tattoo artist and you are looking for work, make sure to contact 13 Daggers Tattoo in Clarksville, Tennessee. Here at Tobacco Road Sports Radio, we ask the tough questions. Hey, you got any left-handed footballs? We're never afraid to tell you how we feel. Come on, we look like the damn bad news bears. We'll debate sports. We'll debate anything. Man, you lying. You ain't never met Martin Luther the King. Not the winner, but yes, he did. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. No, he did not. No matter what, Tobacco Road Sports Radio has you covered. I'm going to come right back at it. Soldier. You're listening to Tobacco Road Sports Radio. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Frankly Speaking Baseball, right here on all our Frankly Speaking Sports and Tobacco Road Sports radio platforms. Oh, baby, what an interview. You don't think Stan's fired up? Oh, my goodness gracious. What a great, great, great interview. And, you know, we're going to keep it on college baseball just for another couple of minutes before we uh, go to Major League Baseball. But, you know, we asked Stan the question at the end, which is the team that might scare you the most this year. And, you know, he mentioned LSU, obviously, with their great pitching, but he also mentioned Tennessee. And I agree with Stan. I agree with them 100%. The team that I said uh, scares me the most, and I will continue to say, unfortunately, they're in the same bracket as us uh, with Stanford and LSU, is the Tennessee Volunteers. Tennessee Volunteers were 43-20 and 20 this year. 43 and 20, 
you know, and they got something to prove. This team has something to prove this year. Last year, they were the number one ranked team. What happened? They got knocked out by the Irish. That's right. They got knocked out by the Irish. You don't think they got something to prove this year? You're darn right they do. And I'll tell you what, with the exception of Wake Forest, who has Rhett Louder, Josh Arnold, Sean Sullivan, like we spoke about earlier with Stan, Tennessee might have the best overall, I say overall pitching staff. When you look at this pitching staff, I mean, you got what, Andrew Lindsay, uh, Chase uh, Dollander, uh, Drew Bream. I mean, they are a good starting three. And then you go to their bullpen. They got Chase Byrne, Seth Halverson, and um, I believe it's Camden Sewell in the bullpen. So this is a very, very, very good pitching staff. The problem is game one, 7 p.m. tomorrow night. Guess what? They face Paul Skeens. Um, of LSU, who should be and could be the number one MLB draft pick in this upcoming draft. Skeens is 12 and 2, 1.77 ERA, has 188 strikeouts in 107 innings. But it goes beyond this. It goes beyond this. They got a well balanced offense as well. I mean, when you look at this team, they got guys up and down one through nine, just like Wake Forest. And when you get this far, you should have. An unbelievable one through nine, and they do. And you had some guys like uh, Huna, um, what is it, Denton? Um, I'm thinking who else? I think Merritt on that team. Just trying to think of some of their players. Offensively, this team can hit the ball and they can hit it with power. So when you look at this College World Series, I'll tell you what, the bracket we're in is just tremendous. It is just tremendous. We know all eight teams or whatever many teams go to. Um, Omaha are going to be good, but I'll tell you what. Look at this bracket. Stanford, who we just watched, Quinn Matthews, <coughs> excuse me, last week had that unbelievable pitching outing. And then you go to LSU, which is playing great baseball. And then we talked about Tennessee. It's going to be a fun, fun ride. I still believe, and I'm not just saying it because I'm biased, but I believe Wake Forest is the best team in the country well-deserving of the number one seed. Let's go in there, guys. We'll start it tomorrow, like I said, less than 25 hours, and let's knock some doors down and bring the trophy home. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's switch it off over to Major League Baseball. And I'll tell you what, you know, right now, folks, only one sport out there. That's right, one sport out there that you can watch the rest of the summer. What is it? Major League Baseball. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got a little uh, cough there. But when you look at this season, lots and lots and lots of surprises in Major League Baseball. I mean, you look in the National League, okay? How about those Miami Marlins? I mean, everybody expected the Braves to be in first place, but did anybody expect the Marlins to be only four and a half games back and six games over 500? Incredible. Then you move to the Central. You get the Pittsburgh Pirates, 34-32. They're leading the division. They are leading the division over Milwaukee. It might be only by a game, but they are leading the division. And watch out. That Cincinnati Reds team is starting to make a move. They're only a game and a half behind Pittsburgh, one game under 500. So look out for them. And then we talked about it quite frequently on the show, and we'll talk about it again later when we have Jesse Friedman on those Arizona Diamondbacks. Incredible, incredible, incredible. 41 and 27. They currently have a three game lead over the Dodgers. Then you move to the American. <laughs> American League, <laughs> wow, I'm sorry, folks, I apologize. Tampa Bay Rays are running away with it, but watch out. Those Baltimore Orioles are having an unbelievable year. Then you go ahead and you move over to the West because nobody in the Central is really having a good year in the American League. How about those Texas Rangers, three-and-a-half game lead, 42 wins? Those are the good things, but how about, folks, how about the disappointment so far this year in Major League Baseball. And three teams stick out. Okay, three teams stick out. First one is, how about the New York Mets? New York Mets are four games under 500. And when you look at this team, I can tell you right now, 
<coughs> everybody says, oh, you know, that it's their offense. Some say it's pitching. You know what? It's both. It is both on this team. The Mets are 21st in batting, 17th on base, percentage 17th in run scoring. And with a lineup that they have, there is no excuse for that. Now, everybody knows what happened to Edwin Diaz before the season started. What a blow, what a blow, what a blow. But the Mets still have a good pitching staff. Everybody, everybody giving crap to uh, Max Scherzer for the year he's having right now. But even Scherzer, he has a winning record, guys. He's 5-2. Five 5-2, and two. Five and two. yes, his ERA is high. You know, Verland has been a disappointment. The starting pitcher on this team, except for Singai, has been terrible, terrible. <coughs> Excuse me, folks. Um, terrible. It's just nothing um, less than terrible. And then offensively, you know, Alonzo's out. Alonzo is out. Twenty, You take 22 homers, 50 RBIs out of your lineup, it's going to cost you. But there's certain Mets doing okay and certain now. You know, McNeil's doing well, but I think some of the brick problems have been the young guys, Beatty, only batting 229. They were expecting a lot of things out of Beatty, and he's just not panning out. Vientos is terrible. One point one seventy eight average in 16 games so far. Lindor, where are you? Where are you, Francisco Lindor? 214. Sure, he has 12 homers. He's batting 214, folks. You know, I do like Kenha, the outfielder, even though he's only batting 247. Think he's a good player. Fam's been doing okay. Okay. Uh, Nemo is Nemo. So, uh, you know. 289, he was hurt. Marte's been doing well. and But the guy, the big disappointment on that team has been Vogelbach. I mean, just doing nothing. He's batting 203, I believe, on the year. And, um, you know, they really like this catcher. Doesn't bat for Harry, but I'll tell you what, he has 12 homers, can hit the ball, this Alvarez. But when you look at the pitching staff, I mean, the, the bullpen is not bad, even without Diaz. You have um, Rayleigh, who has what? 13 saves, and you got uh, David Robinson in that bullpen that has a 1.78 ERA. The problem is starting pitching right now. Verland is 2-3 and three with a 4.40 ERA. I mean, after that, what, McGill's nothing. He's 5-4. and four. Carrasco's no good. They are hurting. Now, New York Mets fans, I will tell you what. I don't believe Max Scherzer is washed up. I don't care who the heck made that comment. I think it's wrong. The Mets do have a good enough team to bounce back and get into the playoffs. Once again, we already say it on the show. It's not the team with the best record. It's the hottest team going into the playoffs. Don't count Buck Showalter and his New York Mets out. And then the Moneyball team. But I don't mean that in the Moneyball content. How about the San Diego Padres? What a disappointment the San Diego Padres have been. I mean, everybody expected them. They bought this team, and they still can't win. They're one game under 500 right now. And I'll tell you what, I like this team. I like this team, and I like this team. But they are not doing it offensively. They're 26th in MLB in batting at a 229 average. They have 23rd in runs, the 10th in home runs. And then pitching has been outstanding. Their ERA is fifth in Major League Baseball. This team is not losing <coughs> because of its bullpen. They're losing, once again, just like the Mets, their starting pitching and their offense. If you look at some of these guys pitching-wise, Michael Walker, what an impressive, <laughs> impressive year he's having at 7-2 and two with a 2.89 ERA. Okay, But after that, if you look up and down the line, I'm looking right now, you got Musgrove, that's four and two. But there's been disappointments. They have on paper the best starting five in Major League Baseball. By far, yet they can't perform. I mean, I like Hader in the bullpen, 16 saves. But you, Darvish, where are you? Seth Lugo, what's going on? Blake Snell's hurt. They have Brent Honeywell, they brought over. From what? I believe the uh, Tampa Bay Rays. Come on, get it together. If you ask me the team with the best chance of bouncing back in Major League Baseball, it has to be the San Diego Padres. Once again, 
They need a couple of guys to get going. They got Bo Guts during the offseason. I mean, Tatis is in the ball. How about Gabby Sanchez bringing life back to um, San Diego? The Mets let him go. What's he's done since going to San Diego? Six homers, 15 RBIs. Meanwhile, Matt Carpenter just ain't cutting it over there. And how about a door only batting 216? These guys are too good. They will bounce back as well as the New York Mets. But one team I don't know if they'll ever bounce back has to be the St. Louis Cardinals. My goodness gracious, 27 and 42. And I'll tell you what, this is all pitching. Great pitching and defense wins games. They don't have it right now in St. Louis. Offensively, they got people who can hit the ball. They got Goldschmidt. They got Arenado. They got Gorman on that team. They got Newt Barr, who I like a lot. I mean, there's some good, good young talent offensively. Now, Wilson Contreras has been a bust so far, only batting 198 on the season. But when you go to their starting pitching, where is it? Flaherty, 3-5. and five. Mats, 0 oh and 7, Steve Mats. Wainwright, 2 and 1. I'm looking down here. Montgomery, 3 and 7. I mean, this team is a team that has a lot of issues <coughs> in the starting pitching. And then, of course, they have a lot of issues in the bullpen as well. Offense will only take you so far. Pitching and defense wins championships. But, folks, those are my three most disappointing. Um, team so far in Major League Baseball. Love to get your feedback as always. You can leave messages on our show or go to franklinkinsports at gmail.com. Well, folks, when we come back from break, we're going to go ahead and talk about a team that has been very, very surprising this year. <clears throat> we're going to have Jesse Friedman, beat writer at Phoenix, PHNX underscore sports who covers the um, Arizona Diamondbacks with us. And I'll tell you what, we're going to talk about this surprise team in the National League. Let's go ahead. Let's take a break. We'll be back right after this. Tobacco Road Sports Radio is so excited to be your home for triad sports. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. We heard you loud and clear. Our mission is to give you what you want. You know what I want. I've been asking for it for years. Give it to me. Give me what I want. The best sports talk in live sports in the triad, period. What's up, everybody? Live with Brandon Blake. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Score once again with Brett Wiseman. Hello and welcome back to the Pit Stop here on Tobacco Road Sports Radio. Welcome back to Franchise Players, your home for triad sports coverage. I'm your host, Desmond Johnson, here on Tobacco Road Sports Radio. And if you think that's great... Wait until you see what's next. It's going to be good. It's going to be huge. It's going to be huge. Tune in at TobaccoRoadSportsRadio.com. And don't forget to download the new Roku channel, Tobacco Road Sports Radio. 13 Daggers Tattoo Studio is looking for a new tattoo artist. Must be established with a strong portfolio and good work ethic. Stop by today at 13 Daggers across from Patriot Park on Fort Campbell Boulevard. Clarksville's ultimate tattoo studio. Tattoos, touch-ups, and consultations. See the artist's work online at 13DaggersTattoo.com and get the custom experience you want with Killer Ink. Book today and get pricked by a pro. 13 Daggers Tattoo Studio. Looking hard on the boulevard. We love sports. Joe Lewis, the greatest boxer ever lived. Not only do we love sports, but we love to debate sports. He was bad in Cat Clay. He bad in Sugar Ray. He bad in that. Who that's you? The new boy. Mike, 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 Mike look like a bulldog. He bad in him too. He the whip Mike Tyson there. He whip all that. For the best sports analysis in the triad. What about Rocky Marciano? In-depth local coverage of your favorite schools and teams. Let me tell you something wonderful. Rocky Marciano was good. But compared to Joe Lewis, Rocky Marciano ain't and of course, the best sports debate in the triad. Big Joe Lewis is ass. Welcome to Tobacco Road Sports Radio. Joe Lewis was 75 years old when he fought. You're welcome.
Welcome back to Frankly Speaking Sports on all of our Tobacco Road Sports Radio.com outlets. You know, when you think of Major League Baseball this year and you think of the teams that are really doing well, you look in the American League, everybody talks about the Tampa Bay Rays and the Texas Rangers. When you go to the National League, of course, the Atlanta Braves, what can you say about the Braves? But when people looked at the NL West before this season started, all the talk you could hear about was either the San Diego Padres, the L.A. Dodgers, and how great they are. And however great they might have seemed to be, there's still another team in the NL West standing out, and that is the Arizona Diamondbacks. Talk about a well-balanced team. Diamondbacks have done it all this year. Great timely hitting, great pitching, great defense, great running the bases, you name it. And it is a great honor, thrill and pleasure to now have on the, um, actually on via the uh, TobaccoRoadSportsRadio.com hotline, let's welcome in Arizona Diamondback beat writer at PHNX underscore d and PHNX underscore sports. Let's welcome in Jesse Friedman. Jesse, how you doing? I'm doing great, Frank. Thanks for having me. Ah, thanks for coming on. Hey, you know, Jesse, I just mentioned, you know, everybody talked before the season started about the Dodgers, about the Padres. And, you know, yet it's the Diamondbacks leading that division by four games. This is the Diamondbacks team was 74 and 88 last year. So it wasn't like they were a spectacular team. What has been the turnaround, the major reason for this unbelievable turnaround so far in 2023, I think there's a few of them that you could that you could pinpoint. The the biggest one for me, though, Frank, is Corbin Carroll, uh, who is a 22 year old outfielder, 5'10", 165, not exactly an imposing figure, uh, but the man right now has a pretty viable case to be the front runner uh, in the NL MVP race. He has been that good. Uh, a lot of people entering the season expected him to be a prime candidate for the Rookie of the Year award, uh, and he has done so much more than that. Uh, Corbin Carroll is on pace to hit over 30 home runs, to steal nearly 50 bases. He has an OPS just shy of a thousand at this point in the season. So obviously, it's still early, um, but I mean, he he is on track to have one of the best seasons by by a Diamondback ever. Uh, at the age of, of 22. So I think things start there for this team. Uh, the Diamondbacks also have gotten a pretty solid production from the top of their rotation in Zach Gallen and Merrill Kelly. Uh, Zach Gallen finished fifth in Cy Young voting in the National League last year. So a name that I think uh, people around the game are, are starting to get a little more familiar with, and, and rightfully so. Uh, he has continued his success into this year. And and then Merrill Kelly, a, a guy who just a couple years ago was uh, more of a number four, number five starter type. Uh, but the last couple years, he has he is developed uh, into much more than that uh, here in his mid-30s. So, you know, you uh, talk about... Um, really provided a lot of stability. Yeah. You know, you talk about uh, Kettle Mate. Um And, uh, you know, it surprised me because I remember, I think it was last year, don't, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Jesse, but I think they signed him to a contract extension. And a lot of people, especially in the Arizona area, were skeptical about why would you put this guy on a five-year extension, but what does he do in return? What is he batting? 280, nine homers, 20, what, 26 RBIs and six stolen bases. I mean, what's been a turnaround for this kid? Yeah, it, it's it's so true. I mean, late last year, that contract extension did not look good. Uh, the D-backs have him under control through 2027, and uh, yet 2022 was one of his worst seasons ever. Uh, so things were not looking good for him entering this season. But, yeah, you kind of figured he, he might find a way to bounce back. Until Marte, uh, you know, got some MVP votes back in 2019. He was that good. Uh, 2020, he was also uh, very, very good, despite some injuries. Um, but yeah, I, I think for him this year, the key has been a little bit more of a patient approach. Uh, he's a he's a switch hitter, uh, has always had more success batting right-handed than left-handed, but I think at times he can get a little bit jumpy from, from the right side. He knows that he has uh, so much power from that side, and I think he gets a little bit antsy up at the plate. This year, we've seen a much more balanced, patient approach, and it's certainly paid dividends for him. We're talking to Jesse Friedman, um, 
um, actually beat reporter for the first place. It's got to sound beautiful. Arizona Diamondbacks at PHNX underscore D-backs and PHNX underscore sports. You know, you mentioned a couple of guys. You mentioned Carol. I mean, what can we say about him? But this is a lineup that I mentioned earlier in the, in the um, interview is they got Guriel who's hitting the ball. They got Christian Walker. How about Emmanuel R Rivera? Where did he come from? I mean, this lineup up and down one through nine is a pretty good contact hitting baseball team. Yeah, it's it's true. The Diamondbacks are are have, have seen near the bottom of the league the entire year in strikeouts. Uh, they they put the ball in play, and you're right. There's a lot of depth up and down this lineup. Evan Longoria, uh, you know, at the age of 37, is another guy I would I would add to that mix. Less so from a contact side, but you know, he's really provided some some much needed thump uh, in this lineup uh, against lefties. Um, but yeah, Emmanuel Rivera is a guy the Diamondbacks traded for last year. Uh, Luke Weaver had about two months left on his contract. The Diamondbacks traded Luke Weaver to the Kansas City Royals. Uh, and they got a young, controllable third baseman in return in Emmanuel Rivera. And I don't know if he's going to hit 360 uh, for the entire season, but... It is really incredible what he's been able to do for this team so far. And, you know, we talk about a complete team as I have, you know, the bullpen, you know, yes, but it looks pretty solid to me. I mean, Scott, uh, is it pronounced Magoo? I pronounced. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, Magoo. I always mess that name up. You know, he has a 2.97 ERA, 0.87 whip. Then you got, what, Kyle Nelson, um, Andrew Chafin, I believe, is the closer on that team. Talk about the bullpen of this team and how it's helping, you know, this turnaround. Yeah, I mean, I think the D-backs in past years have gone with a with a strict closer role under Tori Lovello, their manager. Uh, but this year, they've kind of switched things up a little bit. It's it's more of a closer by committee setup. Uh, we have seen Andrew Chafin in that role. We've seen Miguel Castro in that role. Uh, more recently, we've seen Scott McGuff. Uh, in that role, and, and it seems to have worked pretty well. Uh, the D-backs are kind of playing it based off of matchups, and uh, they've, they've really had some some good success so far. Uh, the bullpen last season was uh, potentially the, the worst in baseball, at least close to the worst in baseball. And I think more than anything, that is, that is you know, maybe been the biggest surprise about the 2023 Diamondbacks is their bullpen went from being consistently one of the worst in the league year after year uh, to this season where, uh, you know, it's not elite. I, I wouldn't describe it as elite. I think they want to add the trade deadline, but it's been significantly better than it was last season. You know, we mentioned some of the talent on this team already, and you just mentioned the bullpen being probably the biggest surprise, which I definitely agree with you on. But besides the, you know, Corbin Corral, who, like we mentioned a couple times already, is having a spectacular, uh, you know, rookie year, who else on this team – has surprised which individual player has surprised you the most besides Corbin Carroll? I think the name that you mentioned earlier, Lourdes Gurriel Jr., uh, has really been crucial for this team. I, I guess it's maybe not a huge shock given that he has had some pretty good offensive years in the past in his days with the Blue Jays. But uh, Lourdes Gurriel, I mean, he, he's had an OPS right around 900 for pretty much the entire season since April at this point. Um, and, and it's been huge for, for the middle of this lineup to not only have Corbin Carroll doing what he's been doing, uh, but to have Lourdes Gurriel in there every day as well. He's a free agent at the end of the year, so the D-backs might not have him for very long, but he has been a huge part of the middle of this lineup, and, and it's been a huge comeback season for him after a couple of years in Toronto where it seemed like his power wasn't quite what it once was. Before we let you run here, Jess, I know time goes quick, but – Second half of the year, we're almost at the All-Star break. Is there anything, in your opinion, that the Diamondbacks need to maybe add at the trade deadline? And part two of the question is, what do they have to do balance of season to maintain this first place? There's definitely moves that, that they would like to make at the trade deadline. We've heard a little bit from their GM, Mike Hazen, on this already. Uh, it sounds like he has interest in adding to the pitching staff primarily, both in the rotation and in the bullpen. I think the Diamondbacks would really benefit from having another 
uh, say, a number three starter to kind of back up Zach Gallon and Merrill Kelly. Uh, they, their production behind those two has been pretty shaky to this point in the season. Uh, I think they could also use some help in the bullpen as much as they have a lot of pitchers who have been pretty good this year. I think they would still love to have, you know, an Araldus Chapman type, uh, something like that for uh, for those high leverage situations late in game, maybe to step in and, and as a full time closer. Uh, and Hazen has also talked about potentially adding a, a power back into the lineup. Uh, it's a little bit unclear positionally how that would fit in. Uh, but the D-backs do have, uh, you know, maybe some room to add one more bat uh, if they're able to find a fit somewhere around the league. Uh, as far as your your second question of, of just maintaining what they've done so far, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's a little bit hard to say. I, I think, uh, you know, maybe it's unrealistic to, to expect Corbin Carroll to continue to produce quite at this level. And, uh, you know, you could maybe say the same about some other players, but... I think that I think the Diamondbacks are, are for real. You, you know, even if they don't win a hundred games, as they're on pace to do right now, um, they're in really good position right now. Even if things do calm down for them, to still win you know ninety ninety five games and, and find their way into the playoffs. And, and for them, that would be a huge accomplishment given where they've been the last couple of years. Are the Dodgers the only team that scares you in that uh, division? I think the Padres are, are certainly there as well. I know that the Giants, I, I wouldn't say I, I would, I really view the Giants as a contender for the division title as much. I, I think the Padres, though, just have so much talent up yeah. and down that roster. Even though it hasn't come together for them this year, uh, I, it's going to be another couple months for me before I, I could possibly dismiss the Padres as a contender in the NL West. All right, my friend. Well, we're out of time, but I want to thank you so very, very, very much taking time out of your busy schedule to join us on Frankly Speaking Baseball this week. It was a pleasure, Frank. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you. All right. That was Jesse Friedman, Arizona Diamondback beat reporter. My goodness, time goes fast. We've had a lot today. I want to thank you all for tuning in to Frankly Speaking Baseball. Until next week, I'm Larry Frank. Good night.